Now, some of you are wondering, listen, is all this real? You see all of these people and you hear them singing and you see them lifting their hands and you wonder in your heart, is this real? Is it just fanaticism? Is it a fairy tale? Or is God really real? And I'm hoping today that if you're having that doubt in your mind, that that question will be settled. And that you'll leave here today knowing that you know, that you know, that you know in your knower. Amen. We all have a knower. It's our spirit. You'll know that Jesus is really alive because he's alive in you. And you'll never be the same. That's my prayer for many of my friends today. And you might have grown up in the church. Jesus is all around you, but is Jesus in you? Do you really know Jesus? Do you know the God of the universe? So I want to pray for you right now. Would you lift your hands to the Lord? Father, I pray for my friends in this place who are struggling. They're wondering, is this just religious hype? All of these songs and all of this joy and all of this emotion, is it really real? And I pray that you would speak to every person here. Would you say this out loud? Say, God, if this is really real, show me today. Speak to me today so that I'll know it's you. I give you permission to change anything in my life that's not right. If you'll help me, Lord, if you'll help me, Lord, I want to change. And I want to know you through your son, Jesus. And we pray it in his name. And everyone said, amen and amen and amen. Give the Lord a shout of praise. The Lord is good. You may be seated. Take your Bible and turn to Psalm 14. Now, I'm from the West, and though I've been coming to Africa now for 20 years, a third of my life, I'll turn 59 tomorrow. It's my birthday. I'm going home on my birthday. I get to celebrate my birthday in Ghana. And though I've been coming to Africa for many years, and I don't feel like Obruni, I feel like Bibini, amen. I feel like an African man. But I'm from the West, and we have a problem in the West, both in Europe and in the United States. And that is, young people by the thousands are walking away from Christianity. As a matter of fact, from any kind of belief. And of course, this started in the West, in the 17th century, we had what was called the Enlightenment. And people began for the first time to seriously doubt the existence of God in the 1700s, the 18th century. And then later, men like Charles Darwin, for the first time, began to try to explain the existence of man without any recourse to God whatsoever. God was no longer necessary in the hypothesis regarding how we came to be. We, he said, over time evolved from simple single cells into multi-complex organisms called man. And he said, we don't need God to explain that. And then Sigmund Freud, the father of psychoanalysis and the father of psychiatry and psychology began to say that God is nothing more than mental projection. We all need some kind of a father figure and so we create in our own mind. It's not that God created us in his image. We have created God in our image and he said we all want a father and so we've made up a father and we've created this concept of God and there's no reality to it. And many people began to march to the beat of the drum of Darwinism and of psychology and psychiatry. And we can turn within to find the answers to our own problems. And then a man named Friedrich Nietzsche wrote a book, and the thesis of that book was that God is dead. And Nietzsche said, we don't need God. 
He said our real desire is a will to power. And so we project these things, but really we want to dominate each other. And a man named Adolf Hitler read Nietzsche's work when he was in prison, and he wrote his own book, Mein Kampf, My Struggle, and of course the rest is history. In the aftermath of the reign of the Third Reich, six million Jews and millions of other people, including Christians like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, lost their lives in the Nazi concentration camps. And since that day in Europe and now in the United States, unbelief, atheism that says there is no God, and agnosticism that says if there is a God, you can't be for sure, you can never really know, have spread like wildfire. And yet in spite of all this doubt and unbelief, here's what I find. The vast majority of people around the world still believe in God. Now they're confused. I find a lot of confusion both in my own country and even in Ghana and throughout Africa, they're confused about who God is. Some people say that God is way up there somewhere. As a matter of fact, Muslims really believe this about Allah. No Muslim will ever call Allah Father. They believe in Allah, and their only hope is to submit Islam, to submit to Allah through the teachings of Quran, and maybe one day Allah will be merciful and you'll do enough good. Your good will outweigh your bad, but you can never really be sure. And in my country, there's something called deism. And deists believe that God made everything. He's the creator, but he's not personally involved in our lives. In other words, the deist says God is not concerned about your problems. God is not concerned about the issues that you face and the challenges that you have. He's way out there like the watchmaker who made the watch, winds it up, and now everything works according to the laws of nature. And then I was in India several years ago for five weeks. Over 10,000 Muslims and Hindus came to Christ. And in one church, I preached to 58,000 people, and in that one church, 5,000 people came to Christ in one day. And many of them were Hindus. Now, if you know anything about Hinduism, you know that while they believe in the one, the Brahman, they believe there are 360 million different expressions. And so they have 360 million different gods and this is called polytheism, the belief that there are many gods. And then my friends who are Buddhist are pantheists. There's so many Chinese now in Ghana. I meet them all the time and I always greet them and I love them. Many are Buddhist. And the Buddhists say that everything is God and God is everything. That's called pantheism. And they say if you want to get to know God, then get to know yourself or walk or roll in the, fly, in, in the grass or smell a flower or hug a tree because they say the flower and you and the grass and your dog, everything is God and God is everything. But I want to talk to you today about a different kind of God. As a matter of fact, the God that I want to talk to you about, this is what the Bible says in Psalm 14, verse 1. The Bible says, the fool, everyone say that word, the fool, say it again, the fool. The fool has said in his heart, not in his head, but in his heart. Listen, look at me. Atheism is not a mental problem, it's a moral problem. It's not an intellectual problem. It's an issue of ethics. The fool has chosen to say in his heart, there is no God. Now, the Bible never attempts to prove God's existence. The very first words of the Bible are in the beginning, God. And the Bible says that it is a very foolish person who denies in her heart the existence of God. Now, why would the Bible make such a harsh statement to call someone a fool. Why would the Bible say only a fool would say there's not God? It is because the evidence in favor of the existence of the God of the Bible is so overwhelming that to deny his existence would be like sticking your head in the intellectual sand and saying, closing your eyes to all of the evidence around you. And if you can do that, the Bible says you're very foolish, amen. For example, creation. Creation tells us that there must be a God. 
Now, the scientists tell us that the Earth's atmosphere is 78% nitrogen and 21% oxygen and 1% a dozen different trace elements, and that is the only atmosphere known. We're going to Mars now to try to find out if we can live there, but they say that, that Mars is uninhabitable on its own because the only the only atmosphere known to science in the entire universe that is capable of sustaining human and plant and animal life is right here on planet Earth. And the earth is tilted on its axis at 23 degrees, not 21 or 23. If it, if, it were, if it were just one degree off one way or the other, the gravitational pull of the moon would create huge tidal waves that would destroy the land surface of the earth and we could not live. They say that if the earth were just 10% larger or 10% smaller, it could not sustain human life. They say if it were one degree closer to the sun, it would burn up like a cinder. One degree further from the sun, it would freeze hard like an ice cube. And they tell us that 40 miles up and a fourth of an inch thick, there's something that encases, it encircles, it envelops the earth. And the scientists have no idea how it got there, and it baffles them, but they call it the ozone layer. And they say that it is absolutely necessary for the protection of our planet from the deadly rays of the sun. It is so high tech, so intelligently designed that it filters the sun's deadly rays and it keeps them from piercing through our atmosphere and frying us up like sausage in a skillet. And yet it allows other rays to come through that are needful for human and plant and animal life. What am I saying? Here's what I'm saying. The earth is the perfect size. It's in the perfect place. It's positioned perfectly in relation to the sun. It has the perfect atmosphere, the perfect protection. How in the world did all that happen if there is no intelligent designer, if there is no creator, if there is no God? Amen. How did it happen? What would you think of me if you said, Scott, I like your watch. How did you get that watch? What would you think of me if I said, well, billions and billions of years ago, out in the cosmos, there was this cellular soup. And infinitesimal bits of protons and neutrons and electrons began rubbing together until there was a greater frequency and a greater density. And one day the entire universe contracted with a cold swoosh and then expanded with a hot big bang. And I looked up in the sky and tumbling down through the heavens, there was my watch. Let me tell you something, dude. If you believe that, your cheese has slid off your cracker. Amen? I mean, man, if there is a watch, then there has to be a watchmaker. If there's a building, there has to be an architect. If there is an automobile, there has to be an engineer. And if there is a universe with precision and design and detail and predictability, then there must be an intelligent designer. There must be a creator. There must be a God. And that's why the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows forth his handiwork. Come on, somebody. Give this God praise. Amen. You're not the product of some green blob of slime crawling up out of the sea and after millions of years growing an arm, a leg, a tail, and saying, what's up? That's not how you got here. Your body is a medical and scientific miracle. What a, what a magnificent creature created in the image of God you are. For example, your Blood cells, the red blood cells created in the marrow of the bone. It is the only cell that upon entering the bloodstream gives up its nucleus so that it can take on more oxygen so that you could be alive. They can't explain how it happens. You've been designed that way. And the eyeball, far more sophisticated than any camera ever designed by scientists in a laboratory and shot into outer space. And there are miles and miles of electric synapses that fire, everyday fire, moving your arms and your legs and your brain and your mouth so you can speak. You're not the product of the random collision of atoms. God made you in his image. Some people believe something like this. Once I was a tadpole swimming in a brook 
And then I was a bullfrog with a brand new look. And then I was a monkey swinging through the trees. And now I'm a doctor with a PhD. But you know better than that. There's a God who made you in his image. Amen. And creation tells us that there must be a God. Your conscience tells you there must be a God. There's something deep within all of us that tells us that there's something more Something beyond us. The philosophers talk about the metaphysical. It is beyond the physical, beyond what you can touch or taste or smell or see. There's something out there. We all know it, and we all have a sense of oughtness. We know that certain things are right and certain things are wrong. We know it innately and intuitively. There is a moral law that is stamped upon our very soul because there is a moral lawgiver. There is a creator. There's never been a continent discovered, no matter how backward the civilization civilization or how dark the, the, the intelligence, there's never been a culture found anywhere that did not worship something. We are hardwired to believe in God. We cannot help it. If there was no God, we would invent one. It's almost as if we must worship even our physical being. We are homo erectus. We are erect. We look up. It's natural for us to look up. In ancient Egypt, they worshiped the Nile River, and they would sacrifice their babies to the crocodile in the Nile. They said it's the source of all life, and they worshiped the sun. They called it Ra. They knew there was a God. And the Muslims worship Allah, and the Jews worship Jehovah, and modern men worships the gods of materialism and money and intelligence and beauty. But we all worship. Our conscience tells us that there's a God. We cannot get away from it. Deep at night when there's no one there, the darkness when we're on our own bed thinking about our own thoughts, somehow we're directed to someone who is beyond us. Amen. What about the Bible? How do you explain the Bible? Now, the Bible is not one book. The Bible is a library of 40 Different, written by 40 different authors, 66 books, 40 different authors, three different languages from three different continents, different types of men wrote the Bible under different kinds of circumstances. And yet when they, when they gathered up all the parchments and the manuscripts and the fragments and put them all together, the Bible reads like one book written by one author and it has one message and that is that there is a God and that he loves you and that he longs to have relationship with you. But for years, people did not believe the Bible. For example, the skeptics came along and they read about Moses. And they said, well, Moses could not have written the Ten Commandments because in the days of Moses, people could not write at all. And then archaeology was discovered and they began to dig around in that part of the world, the ancient Near East, and they uncovered something called the black steel. And on the black steel, there was something written called the Code of Hammurabi. And it predated Moses by 1,500 years. And they found out that not only could Moses write, but people had been writing for hundreds of years before Moses. Amen. They read about the Hittites and the Canaanites and all these other Amorites and all these people. And people laughed and said, well, those are fictitious people. This is nothing more than a myth, a saga, a fairy tale. Until once again, the archaeologist Spade began to dig. And they found over a thousand years of recorded Hittite civilization. And once again, the Bible proved the skeptics wrong. Amen. They read about Jericho. We sang a moment ago about Jericho and the walls falling and the skeptics laughed until the archaeologists. Matter of fact, archaeology has confirmed everything spoken of in the Bible. So they began to dig around and they found the ancient city of Jericho. And guess what? The archaeologists surmised. They said something cataclysmic must have happened to this city. It's obvious in the record, in the archaeological record, the walls fell down. And guess what? When they fell down, they fell down flat, just like the Bible said. Matter of fact, you know what I found out? When I meet somebody who says, I don't believe the Bible, the first question I ask them is this. Have you ever read the Bible? And nine times out of ten, the reply is, 
No. And I say that's really not fair, is it, intellectually. That's like saying I don't believe in mathematics, but I've never read a math book. What about Jesus? What do you do with the person? Now, there's no doubt that there was a man who lived and died named Jesus. Not only the Gospels, but other historians like Suetonius and Josephus and Tacticus, secular historians, write about this man, Jesus, who was crucified and whom his followers said came back alive. But who is Jesus? Muslims say he's a prophet, Buddhists say he's a teacher, and he certainly was those things. And then modern liberal theologians say he was a great moral example, and certainly there was no one who ever lived such a superlative life ethically and morally like Jesus, but he claimed to be more than that. Did you know that? You know Jesus claimed to be more than a prophet and more than a teacher and more than a good example. Jesus claimed to be God in flesh. He used the Tetragrammaton. The Tetragrammaton is the sacred name of God. We call it I Am. It's the name that Moses, that Yahweh revealed to Moses. I Am. I Am the self-existent one. Theologians talk about aseity. It is only ascribable to God. No man could ever look at you and say, I Am, because he would be claiming divinity. And yet time and time again, Jesus said, I Am the bread of life. I Am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, when you look at these eyes, you're looking into the eyes of omnipotence. When you hear my voice, you're hearing the voice that spoke the whole universe into existence ex nihilo, out of nothing. Now, he could have been a liar. Some people say Jesus was a con man. He was a liar. And yet, how could a con man make truthful persons out of a liar? Some people say he was crazy. He was a lunatic. But how can a lunatic inspire the world's greatest culture and architecture and literature everywhere Jesus' teachings and his followers, his disciples went? Civilization has flourished and hospitals have been built and universities have been built and orphanages have been all to the glory of this man, Jesus. He's no liar, and he's no lunatic. Look at me, man. He is Lord, and his life, his miracles, his sinlessness, and his resurrection. There's an empty tomb in Jerusalem. Last Sunday, the whole world celebrated the fact that Jesus is not a man who lived and then died. He's a man who died, and now he lives. Christ is alive, and his very life and death and resurrection prove that there must be a God. Amen. And then change lives. Prove that there must be a God. Have you ever heard the name Lou Wallace? Lou Wallace was an Englishman who was an atheist. He was an unbeliever. And Lou Wallace said, I'm going to write a book. He said, I'm going to research history, and I'm going to write a historical book to disprove that Jesus Christ ever lived. And so Lou Wallace, the atheist, began to investigate. He went to the historical sources. He read the Gospels and all the other extra-biblical sources, and Lou Wallace did write a book. He wrote a book called Ben-Hur. And it is a historical novel about a follower of Jesus. Lou Wallace was converted to Christ. Through historical research, he became a believer. He wrote Ben-Hur. They turned it into a motion picture that won Academy Awards. And and, and, and Lou Wallace became an outspoken Christian for the rest of his life. Same way with C.S. Lewis. Have you heard of C.S. Lewis? He was a Cambridge professor of English literature who laughed at the idea of God. He said the Bible is just nonsense and all these Christians, it's nothing more than fanaticism and emotional hype. And then C.S. Lewis, for the first time, in his life as an adult, he began to read the pages of the Bible. There was an emptiness, just like there's an emptiness in the heart of every man. The great French physicist Pascal said there is a God-shaped vacuum on the inside of every man, and he said we're empty until we find a relationship with God through Christ. And Lewis began to read the pages of the Bible, and he began to go to his knees for the first time in his life. He had some problems, and he went to his knees, and he said he became the most reluctant convert 
in all of Great Britain. C.S. Lewis became a Christian. He became an apologist. He's written the book Mere Christianity and many, many other books to defend the Christian faith against those who are atheists and agnostics. Amen. Nikki Cruz was a tough street kid who grew up in Brooklyn, New York in a gang. He carried a switchblade everywhere he went and he would open that switchblade and cut people. He was into Santeria, which is like fetish over in the United States because of his culture, he was Puerto Rican. He was into witchcraft, his mother was a witch. And one day a skinny little preacher named David Wilkerson walked up to Nicky Cruz and smiled and said, Nicky, Jesus loves you. And Jesus died for you. And that street gang, Nicky Cruz, popped open that switchblade and stuck it to that little skinny preacher's throat. And he said, if you ever say that to me again, I'll cut you into a million pieces. And David Wilkerson smiled and said, go ahead and cut me, Nicky. And every piece of my body that falls to the ground will scream out to you, Jesus loves you. Nicky Cruz said that he dropped the switchblade. He ran into the darkness. Two weeks later, he was converted to Christ. Now he's an evangelist that travels all over the world. The book, The Cross and the Switchblade, was written about the life and witness and powerful conversion of Nicky Cruz. How do you explain these things if there is no God? How do you explain the life of a little boy who grew up in a bar? His mother was a prostitute. As a young, at a young age, he began to drink heavily, and then he began to use drugs, and then he became a criminal. Someone tried to talk to him about God. He said, I don't believe in God. Two weeks later, he was arrested. He was put in a jail cell in the United States looking at five years in the penitentiary. In that jail cell, he got down on his knees. He cried out to the God whom he had once denied. He walked out of that jail cell a new man, and he's speaking to you right now. Don't tell me there's no God, man. I'm living proof that there is a God. You say, okay, I believe. I mean, when I think about creation, somebody had to make all this. And when I think about my own conscience, I know there's a God. The Bible says we try to push down the truth of the existence of God, but we can never get away from it. It's almost as if God has stamped, made by God in our gut, and we can never get away from it. You say, when I think about the Bible and the power and the life-changing, but there's something when I read the Bible, it speaks to me. It's not just black ink on white paper. It comes alive. And when I think about Jesus and the cross, and when I see the lives of my friends whose lives have changed, they're not perfect, but they have changed, I realize there must be a God. Listen to me, and I'm finished. Look at me. Everybody look this way. Watching my television. Look right here. I'm glad you believe in God, but that is not enough. It's not enough to believe in God. Even the God of the Bible, even the God who eternally exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the three, and it's not enough just to believe in God. Look at me. The devil believes in God. The Bible says the demons tremble. It's not enough to believe in God. Did you know that if some of you died, I'm talking to you, church members, you can die and go to hell with a communion wafer stuck in your throat. You can die and go to hell right out out of the baptistry because you just went down a dry center and came up a wet center. Hell is going to be full of Presbyterians and Methodists and Catholics and Anglicans and Lutherans and Pentecostals because it's not the the church of Christ that saves you. It's the Christ of the church that saves you. And the issue is not do you believe in God because most people believe in God. And if some of you died, you would miss heaven and go to hell by 18 inches. 18 inches from right here to right here because you believe in God and Jesus is all around you and you've been raised in church and your mama's a Christian and your grandma's a Christian and you know all about God but you have never met God personally. And that's what the cross is about. And I'm asking you today to come in simple childlike faith to the cross 
And to believe that when Jesus hung on the cross and shed his blood, when they disfigured his face and put a crown of thorns on him and drove nails through his hands and feet, that he was dying for you. He was dying instead of you. He was dying because of you. He was dying out of love for you. And he loved you so much. You know what kept Jesus on the cross? Not nails. Jesus was God in human flesh. He could have snapped his finger or whispered a prayer or thought a thought and all of heaven's angels mounted on white angelic horses would have been there in a flash to take him down off the cross. He didn't have to die. Nails did not keep Jesus on the cross. His love for you kept him on the cross. He loved you. And he was dying for you. And three days later, he rose from the dead, and that makes him the most unique person who has ever lived. You cannot compare Jesus with Muhammad or Buddha or Krishna or any other religious leader or philosopher who has ever lived. Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, and you must come to him. And You don't have to have it all figured out. You don't understand in order to believe. You believe in order to understand. And I found in my life that when I came to Christ like a little child in faith, believing that what he did, he did for me, that all of the great things that I had questioned, they all began to come into focus. And listen, life began to make sense because I knew the author of life itself. I'd like to ask every person in this room and those of you watching online and way back in the back and the overflow, I want everyone in the room to bow your head and close your eyes all over this building. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And I must ask you a question. How many of you, don't just believe in God, but how many of you have come to know God personally through Jesus Christ. You're not just a member of the church. It's not just that you've been baptized or you can recite the Apostles' Creed or take communion. But how many of you know this God who created everything? You know him through Christ. And if your heart stopped beating, you're certain that heaven would be your home, and you found hope. I'm not asking you if you're perfect. No one is perfect, but are you forgiven? Do you know Christ? If that's you, would you just lift a hand toward God as if to say, Lord, I love you? Would you just put a hand in the air? If you know that you know that you know that you're saved, put a hand in the air or put both hands in the air and just say, Lord, I love you. Just tell him that. Say, thank you for saving me. Say, Jesus, where would I be without you? Just love on him. All God wants is our gratitude. He wants us to live in an attitude of gratitude. Thank you, Lord, the creator of all things, the one who spoke and everything came into existence out of nothing, is your Father through faith in Christ. Thank you, Lord. He's for you and not against you. Thank you, Jesus. You may put your hands down. But could I ask you a question? Do you have a friend? who needs Jesus? Do you have a family member, a coworker, a classmate, someone that you care about? How many have someone in your life, you care about them, you love them, and you know that if they died today, they would not go to heaven? Can I see your hand if you've got a friend, a family member? Yes. I'm here today because my friends prayed for me and they loved me and they shared the gospel with me. And I'm going to ask you to begin to pray by name for your friend. Matter of fact, some of you might want to get up out of your seat very quietly, very reverently, and slip down here to the altar and kneel down and with tears in your eyes begin to cry out to God, Lord, save Kwame. Lord, save Kofi. Lord, save my friend. Just come on. If you have a friend that you're burdened for, get up quietly out of your seat and come kneel here and begin to pray for them right now by name. Come on. Christians who are burdened. Christians who are burdened for the lost, get on your knees and begin to pray. Begin to pray. Begin to say, God, save my daddy. Save my mom. My friend at the university is an atheist. Save my friend. No one's too hard for God. Come on, pray for them. God, give us a burden. They that sow in tears 
shall reap in joy. Some of you have friends who are away from God. Maybe they grew up in the church. You might have a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter. I had a prodigal mother. But God saved my mama. She's in heaven today. God can save your mom. And then I want to speak to those of you who could not lift your hand. You do not know the Lord. A friend invited you today. And they're praying for you. Somebody's weeping over you. They've been praying for you for a while. And that's why you feel so convicted sometimes. And even guilty. You know why you feel guilty? Because you're guilty. And the only one who can take that guilt away is Jesus. And he'll do it if you'll ask him. Somebody's praying for you. I've been praying for you. I want to give you an opportunity to open up your heart and say yes to the God who made everything. To the God who loved you so much that he gave his son to die on the cross. And he proved that his son's death was enough by raising him from the dead. That's the proof that what Jesus did was enough. It's the receipt that the payment was made in full. And that's why Christ is alive. To demonstrate to the whole world. And he's coming back one day. Are you ready to meet him? people are praying for you. I want to ask you to stay on your knees and just pray for people in this room, people who are watching online that need Christ. And I'm going to voice a prayer. If you could not lift your hand to say, I know that I'm saved. I know that I'm ready to meet God. I want to ask you to open your heart. The Lord will help you. You say, my heart's hard and cold. That's all right. God will break your hard heart. He'll open up that empty heart, that hard heart, that cold heart. He'll warm it up. You can feel his presence if you'll just ask him. Something this simple. Are you ready? Let's all pray. Say, Jesus. Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. For loving me. For loving me. For going to the cross for me. For going to the cross for me. I believe that you're alive. I believe in your life. I don't understand it all. I don't understand it all. But I know in my heart it's true. But I know in my heart that it's true. And God, I know you're real. I know you made me. I know you made me. And that even though I've sinned, even though I've sinned you, love me, you love me. And you sent Jesus for me. And you sent Jesus for me. How could I turn you away? Today I want to say yes. Today I want to say yes. If you'll take me, if you will take me as broken as I am, as, as sinful as I am, as I am if, you'll take me, if you will take me, I want to give you my life. I want to give you my life. I want to follow you. I want to know you. I want to obey you. I want to serve you. I want to tell others about you. God, save me. I don't want just to believe in you. I want to know you. I give you my heart. And I'm serious in Jesus' name. Now heads are bowed and eyes are closed and Christians are praying. I have to ask you this question. Is there anybody in this room who prayed that simple prayer with me today? And you meant it. It might be the first time ever. It might be the first time in a long time because you've gotten so far away from everything you were ever taught to believe. You've been out in the far country, but God has spoken to your heart. Is there anyone who prayed with me just now and you meant business? If that's you, would you look up at me now and let your eyes meet mine? God bless you. God bless. Just let your eyes meet mine all over. Yeah, I see all over this room. People who are saying, I don't want to just believe in God. I want to know God. I want to give God my life. Now, I want to ask you one question. Do you mean it? Because it's one thing to sit out there and say, yeah, you know, I mean it. Yeah, it's another thing to put feet to your faith and faith to your feet and say, I'm not Jesus. And I'm going to ask you to do what we've seen in the last two weeks in this church, probably 400, 500 people do, and what I've seen a half a million people do in person around the world. I'm going to ask you not to be ashamed of Jesus. If you mean it, here's what I want you to do in just a moment. In a moment, everybody's going to stand, but I don't want you to wait on anybody. I'm going to ask you to leave your seat, leave the balcony. It'll take a couple of minutes more. If you're in the back, it'll take a couple of minutes more. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and hold your head up high because you never did anything better in your life. Push your way through these people and come and stand right here facing me because I want to pray with you, give you some information, 
and say welcome to the family of God. I'm not asking you to become a member of Agape House. I'm asking you not to be ashamed of Jesus. And so if you mean business, if you're looking up at me and you mean business, I want you right now to get up out of your seat and come and make it. That's right. Come on. Get up right now and don't be ashamed. Praise God. Get up and come and come to Jesus and let's all stand together and give people room as they come. Everyone stand all over the room. Come on.